also in the, also in the room, um, and uh, my expert. Nurse um, um, has come by default by the fact that I was part of the team who wrote the guidance with CDAC. Um, so by all means, um, feel free to, to dispute what I'm saying. Um, if you think you've got better evidence from the field. Um, some of this is theoretical uh, and we'd like you guys to engage and talk, or you folks even, to engage and talk about um, you know, different examples that you may have come across because I'm sure many of us have come up against some rumours um, and how they have maybe aided or maybe abetted um, programmes that we've been running in the field. So um, as Kirsten said, I'm currently the thematic manager for CEA at NORCAP, but I previously have worked for CDAC when we worked with this and, and Ultra and a number of different other agencies working on um, CAAP, CEA, whatever you want to call it. So today we were just going to really briefly talk about rumours, why they're important, and then touch on expectations, because I think it's important that we consider them together um, very much in how we engage communities, because if we manage expectations, we can better manage rumours. Um, I'm going to assume that there is a basic level of what community engagement is from the what we're talking about but you know principally we're talking about information provision participation and complaints and feedback or, or two-way dialogue with communities affected by disaster um from the looks of you as you introduce yourself i'm pretty sure you all know that already but we'll just start there so if we just think about what a rumor is um and i it's an interesting concept and I think in different societies or in different cultures it might be considered differently um, and we you know should acknowledge that when we're working across the globe but there are potential consequences of when people are unclear about what is happening um, and rather than ignoring rumours sorry are you moving at the same speed as me on slides there we are sorry I've got two screens and it, we're confusing I feel I'm confusing myself either. Um, and so rather than ignoring rumours, um, which I think traditionally humanitarian actors have done, or, you know, sort of laughed them off and, and, and they've been an interesting thing to talk about in, you know, in, after a meeting or something. We're now looking at how we can embrace them and, and work with them to find out about our programmes, um, identify lacks of inf lack or gaps of in, in information, and help us understand what the feeling the community is feeling and people are thinking so if we go back to that information provision participation complaints and feedback we've got what rumors can spread across all three of those elements and identify where we haven't provided the right information where we're not inviting participation and maybe some might come in through a complaints or feedback mechanism um, or, or maybe it will highlight where we need to provide more information into that system um, and so, the, you know, they're very natural and they happen when during mostly a lack of information, but there's some other ways that, that have come up. Um, if we were in a room together, we would play a, a game called Broken Telephone at this point, where I would say something to Kirsten, who would say something else to Giovanna, and, and it would go around. Um, and I'm sure many of you remember playing this game as a child and, and know how, you know, if I say one message at the beginning, by the time it's got around the circle, the message has changed quite substantially. Um, and that's another way of exa giving examples of how rumours and, and misinformation or disinformation spread. So this is sort of uh, more written out about what I've just said. Um, un unverified information. They flourish when there's too little or too much information that people are unable to check what is right or not. And I think that this too much information is key. And, and, and this is very much about understanding the communication needs of the communities we're working with. Um, so very much how they like to receive information. Um, and again, to just, you know, not again, I haven't said it yet, but I do like to reiterate the fact that we talk about communities as if they're homogenous. Um, and of course, we all know from our work that they're not homogenous. So 
you might want to provide a lot of information to a certain group of the popular of, of a certain group within the community and then maybe more abridged information for other people to ensure that the, everybody has access to stuff to the right level of information um, they can help us better understand communities and how we work and deliver on global commitments we won't talk too much about global commitments here we don't need to so then we've got, sorry, I can't look up yeah, the types of rumour. Here we have a rather evil looking woman um, spreading rumours. I found that picture on clip art, so apologies. But there's, an there's a difference between misinformation, which is information that is unintentionally false, and disinformation, which is intentionally false information. Um, and I think, you know, if we, it's a bit, but we still, if we look at COVID, there's been a lot of misinformation and a lot of disinformation. Um, and of course, depending on who you are and depending on your standpoint, you might view misinformation and disinformation differently to how I might. Um, and I think that that's an important factor to try and understand when we're talking about some of the challenges. Um, so, you know, fake news is, this, is a form of disinformation which is disguised as news. Um, it is intentionally false. Whereas misinformation might be that you understand something different. Please feel free to sort of jump up if you think that this is confusing. Okay. Um, so I think, you know, we need to think about why people share rumors. Um, and, if we were again, if we were in the room together, I'm sure that you could share these these answers these with with me because you know it. So to explain a situation or event, to share useful or entertaining information, to define oneself by being in the know or making others look bad, not very nice. To develop relationships by using information as a currency, um, and I think that this information as a currency phrase. It's something that we need to be really aware of through our community engagement and accountability work. Um, information is power, information is a currency. Take uh, either one of those phrases as you like, but you know, very much the people who have more information tend to have more power. Um, so if you don't have the information, you may make it up, and that's where that falls within you. Um, so that people feel a connection to issues affecting them or to mislead or deceive. Um, and those of us who have the joy of living in Brexit Britain may really understand the mislead or deceive information um, in the politically motivated sphere. Um, does anybody have any sort of examples or want to just jump up now, put your hand up and share just something that might relate to one of those that you've experienced from your work? we're not a very many we're not a big group so i'm sure if you put your hand up we can get something amila amila apologies if i didn't pronounce your name properly first in there well done hi good afternoon um this is amalia from from iom um now that you were asking i mean i'm just thinking about um an example of reasons why people would use humors, uh, rumors for like it comes from Bangladesh and usually what we've seen is that rumors tend to kind of like fill gaps in information that is missing. No? So maybe it's not the motivation that brings people to, to actually um, spread the rumors, but then when there's not enough information, we tend to see that there's the moment where rumors come in. So yeah, just wanted to share this over. Yeah, I mean, exactly. And, um, and sometimes, you know, some of this may come from our, our field staff as well, because, you know, if you're out on a daily basis at a food distribution and you don't know the answer, it's a kind of natural reaction to say something, to just fill the gap, to fill that sort of um, dead air, as, as you might call it, um, with a bit of information. And it's not done in a mischievous manner. Um, it might be done just to get somebody, you know, off your back so you can keep the queue moving and keep, you know, the distribution running. Um, that could be a reason just because people don't have information. So I think, you know, that's very much talks 
as well about us making sure that all of our staff are informed um, as how we work. I'll jump in, Sarah, if you don't mind. I can't figure out, see how to raise my hand, so I'll just raise my voice. Um, uh, in, in, I've done a couple of risk communication and community engagement deployments. And I think it also is used in, as you were saying, as others have said, in, the, in, the, in a lack of information to support a fear, a, a, a fear you might have. So vaccine, you know, getting your child to, to take a vaccine, for example. And it's a legitimate fear since there's a lack of information. So that's another reason why people share rumors. They're trying to gain confidence or make a decision. Yeah, I mean, I, I think vaccines and the RCC field have a lot of evidence and have been working, you know, on a, it's a very specific element of, of rumor spreading for quite some time. And, and there's a lot of evidence from the RCC field there. Um, so uh, thank you, Carolyn. Um, just this is a bit theoretical, and again, this is leaning on the CDAC um, rumor has it guide um, as well. So there's just the theoretical three different types of rumors. So the wish rumors, I heard the government will give us work visas to move overseas. Fear rumors, somebody told us that the aid's running out and will stop in two weeks. And hostility rumors. So my neighbor said that the other ethnic group are getting better food rations than us. Um, and I suspect that many of us through our work in the humanitarian um, field could provide examples of all three of those different types of rumors that we've heard when we're working with communities. Um, and, you know, I think all are equally as valid and all reflect different gaps in information and communication that we're, we're providing to the communities we're working with. Um, so can we just ignore rumors? Is that easiest? Um, and I think this reiterates some of what I said before in the intro, but you know, that rumors are actually a really good way of providing honest feedback on humanitarian programs, um, which is one element. They can also threaten lives and create suffering both for the people you're trying to seek, our staff, and undermine the mission of humanitarian organizations. Um, and of course, you know, Kirsten, talked about social media so we have many different ways of transmitting rumors and the advent of huge whatsapp telegram etc groups where it's very easy to forward information very quickly to a large number of people um, I think is interesting um, and although we don't go into it too much within this presentation um, I think it's also very interesting to look at the role of the diaspora in spreading rumors um, I know from some of the work that I've done with people in Somalia, you know, rumors might start within Somalia, come to a diaspora population, um, get churned around a bit and then go back in a, in a different format, um, creating some real risk to the humanitarian organizations. Um, but then, you know, if you know that, you've also got an, an element of people you can work with. Um, I will move. On so here we are. How to combat rumors? Now this picture here is actually from a migrant centre in London um, when people were arriving and being put in hotels. So and you know people were from all over the world, but all the information was primarily in English um, and not very helpful. So one of the ways to combat rumors is obviously to provide accessible and useful information. And to ensure that there's multiple channels for dialogue and communication. Um, and we spoke a bit about that, and we've got a couple more slides on that as, as well. Um, another example, which recently was used by the cash sector within um, Iraq, was they recently they had to reduce the cash, the cash uh, value amount by 25% or something, quite substantial. Um, and there was a lot of rumors traveling around different WhatsApp, Telegram groups. So they recorded a short video, which was so able to be transmitted, uh, which was then able to be transmitted um, through the different WhatsApp, Telegram groups, etc. And the you know advantage of that was it was a video, so therefore, it couldn't be changed halfway through, which is one of the problems with text messages, et cetera. Um, and it came from somebody senior within the UN. So maybe something to be respected. 
Right then, that was a very rapid run through at the beginning um, of some of the theory. Um, and I believe Kirsten is going to put you into groups of three or four. Um, so if you can screenshot or just, it's not that complicated, take this down. But for about 10 minutes, we were going to ask you to go into different groups and then each one of you spend it one, two, three minutes giving an example of the rumor um, that you've been, you know, an rumor that you've experienced. Think about whether it's misinformation or disinformation. Think about what kind of, um, you know, whether it's a wish rumor, uh, et cetera. Um, I can flash back up to that one if you want. Um, and then say how you dealt with it whilst you're at work. And then within the group, think about the one that's most interesting. And then we can share that with each other and discuss it when you come back. Does that make sense to everybody? Shout if it doesn't. I'm going to go with yes. Um, so, Kirsten, do you want to drop people into groups? Kristen, did you did you keep the recording or you stopped it? I'm okay, I'm not going in the room.